Hello and welcome to 202 Decades of Western History. The quiet of the woods was only broken by the trotting of feet and occasional low, murmuring voices. The morning drizzle had lifted for the moment, but Fabius knew the gray skies of Germania weren't going anywhere. That morning, he and his companions had awoken, packed up their camp, lined up into their column, and began marching again. It had been like this for the past five days, marching and marching, mile after mile, on the muddy path, surrounded in a canyon of trees. Every few hours, they would pass into a clearing where a small village could be seen. Some small huts and walled fields, a few cows, maybe a horse, but always a handful of pale children staring, open-mouthed, as he and his comrades marched past. And then the forest would close back up around them again as they marched on. That was most of the villages, but twice on their march, back from the far camp and the river, they had passed actual towns. Here there had been more homes, and fortresses on the hilltops. Not stone, mind you. These Germans seemed to have an aversion to any building not made of wood but formidable-looking structures nonetheless. Mostly, though, it had just been marching, or sometimes sloshing, down the muddy paths, back toward Gaul, back toward civilization. Well, they had been heading back, but the prior day, they had turned to the right, off the well-maintained path, onto a simple, narrow trail. Fabius never had a good sense of where they were going, or why they did anything. The rumor, though, as told by his centurion, was that they were making a detour to put down a revolt. Maybe he would get to do some fighting at last, and if he was really lucky, some looting. Fabius was near the front of the long column of soldiers, marching six abreast when the trail wasn't too narrow. If they were on a straight stretch, he could even see the golden legionary standard way up at the head of the column. If he looked behind him, all he could see was more and more of his fellow soldiers. Somewhere back there, beyond his view, was General Varus. As he kept marching, the trees opened up to his right. Not entirely, but they were thinner. A wide swamp stretched out in that direction. Perhaps when the country was pacified, the marsh could be drained, and it could be put to some good use. To the left was more thick forest, rising up to a hill. The path curved around to the left, striking a balance between the hill and the swamp. With this curve, the front of the column was out of view. Suddenly, the soldier in front of him came to an abrupt stop, and the soldier behind him actually did bump into him. Fabius cursed and gave the man a look. At the same time, though, a trumpet blew and a call to halt was issued. Why had they stopped? Clearly he wasn't the only one wondering. Several soldiers yelled out, asking what was going on. After a minute or two, word came back from the front of the column that there was a barrier on their path. On this detour, they had already gone around down trees, and parts of the trail had been flooded, but it sounded like this was something else. Going around wouldn't be simple either, with the steep forested hill to their left and the swamp to their right. They would have to clear the barrier or turn around. A horseman galloped past from the front of the column, past Fabius, presumably to receive orders from General Varus. The gray skies must have noticed the stopped column of Romans, because it now began to drizzle again. As Fabius stood wondering what they would do next, he stared blankly up the hill to his left. Then, movement. Deep in the forest, his eyes caught something. Something big had darted between the trees. A bear, maybe? His uncle Titus claimed he had seen one drinking from a stream on one of the campaigns led by Drusus 19 years earlier. More now. His eyes now darted to movement higher up the hill. His heart began to beat fast. He didn't think bears hunted in packs. He was just beginning to convince himself that it was only some more of the German children out for a look at the legions when at that moment he heard a thud and then a scream. Between the bodies of the soldiers in front of him, a few rows up, he could see a man with a spear stuck in his chest. Before he had time to think, a hundred, no, a thousand more javelins rained down from the hillside, crashing into soldiers all around him.
some banging off armor, many meeting flesh. Form up, went out the cry. Easier said than done on the cramped trail. A shout went up in answer from the hillside, and from behind every tree pounced a pale warrior, hurtling over a disguised wall, then down the hillside. Fabius reached back for his shield, but felt it resist. He looked back and found a spear embedded in it was now caught on the armor of the soldier lying dead beside him. He yanked it free at last, and turned back toward the hill. Mere feet from him now was a tall man, with long sandy hair, sprinting toward him. His teeth were bared, and he had death in his eyes. The flash of his sword was the last thing Fabius ever saw. Far south of the site of the battle, under the Mediterranean sun, word of the ambush would take weeks to reach the capital. There, in the heart of the empire, Augustus still lived and ruled as princeps. He had carefully steered the Roman state for the past 36 years. He was older now, but that age had given him the chance to see his projects through and ensure peace and stability the Roman world had not seen for too long. He was the same man we met in the last of the prologue episodes, but his priorities had shifted since the days when he had to subtly consolidate his rule. In his old age, the future for his realm was increasingly on his mind, a future without him there to guide it. Three aspects of Rome's stability found his focus. Improving the morality of the state, finding a suitable successor, and securing the borders of the empire. Since Rome had conquered Greece, and really since it had expanded out of the valley around the Tiber River, there had been citizens decrying the loss of Rome's traditional virtues. In the old days, the story went, Romans were austere, frugal, loyal, and courageous people. Now though, the wealth and culture of the East had corrupted those morals, and replaced them with greed, hubris, duplicitousness, and self-interest. As princeps, Augustus waded into the debate, to his own peril. Will Durant's telling of it is fitting. He destroyed his own happiness by trying to make people good as well as happy. It was an imposition that Rome never forgave him. Moral reform is the most difficult and delicate branch of statesmanship. Few rulers have dared to attempt it, most rulers have left it to hypocrites and saints. I don't think an assessment of Augustus' attempts at a moral reformation could be put more clearly. Part of the concern that brought Augustus to action was the declining population of Romans, particularly of the nobility. Declining fertility is a topic we in the developed world are familiar with today, but it clearly troubled Augustus too. His assessment of the problem was similar to many in our day. The decline in marriage and comforts of the day had led many to forgo the inconvenience of having children. In 18 BC, he'd begun his attempts at reform. With his power as censor, Augustus passed the Lex Julia, the Julian Law, which had a full title of the Julian Law of Chastity and Repressing Adultery. The law put strict penalties on adultery, but especially on the adulterous wife. In another law, Augustus mandated matrimony. All men under 60 and all women under 50 among the upper class of Italians were required to marry. The unmarried were forbidden from inheriting except from relatives, and they were banned from attending public games. Men of senatorial rank could not marry a freed slave, an actor, or a prostitute. Widows were required to remarry within six months or lose their inheritance. A new tax was placed on wealthy women, but the tax was lowered with each child. At three children, she would be free from the tax and from the power of her husband. It should be no surprise that the laws offended just about everyone. The laws were softened almost immediately to allow unmarried men back into public festivals and games. Augustus elevated himself above most politicians in history, but like too many, he was also a massive hypocrite. He engaged in many extramarital affairs, and despite his attempts to encourage fertility, he fathered only one legitimate child. His daughter's name was Julia. Her mother was Scribonia, Augustus's second wife. But Augustus had divorced her on the day of Julia's birth, and had taken her away soon after. She was instead raised by Livia, Augustus's future third wife, and always an exemplar of those old Roman virtues. <laughs> 
Perhaps in rebellion against her father's moral crusade and her mother's stuffy ways, Julia developed a more libertine philosophy to life. Despite her many affairs, to her first husband Agrippa, she delivered five children, who all appeared to be his. When Agrippa died, she went through a succession of lovers with less subtlety now. To try to tame her reputation, Augustus had her marry his stepson, Tiberius. But the stoic Tiberius was a poor match, and her affairs continued apace. According to Augustus' own laws, Tiberius should have reported his wife's adultery, but didn't, to save face for himself and his stepfather. It's clear, though, he hated his wife. The two had separated by the year 6 BC. Julia continued in her salacious affairs until around 1 BC, when Augustus was approached with hard evidence of her immorality and told that she would soon be accused in the courts if he didn't take action. Augustus finally had to reckon with his own morality laws and enforce them upon his own daughter. He exiled her to a tiny island off the coast of Italy. She remained isolated there for five years before her father showed a little mercy and moved her to the toe of Italy, but she would die of starvation there a few years later. As an old man, Augustus could see that his moral reforms had failed. Failed to stop the promiscuity or to restore the fertility of the upper classes, or to reform even his own daughter. His attempts at finding a successor were nearly as unsuccessful as his moral reforms. He knew that the stability he had established could only be continued after him if he had a suitable successor. Despite his constant attention and planning, this replacement eluded him for decades. When he had fallen ill in 23 BC, and most, including himself, thought he would soon die, many had expected he would choose his nephew, Marcellus, to succeed him. But instead, he gave his signet ring, the symbol of his power, not to Marcellus, but to Agrippa. This choice was practical as it eased the fears of monarchy that the Senate still harbored, and Agrippa was by now a seasoned commander and politician. If Augustus were gone, the empire would need Agrippa's skills to prevent a return to anarchy. Marcellus would be there, learning from Agrippa. Until he wasn't. Just as Augustus began to improve in health, Marcellus, only 19 years old, fell ill with a fever and soon died. The first in a series of names that Augustus would have to scratch off his list of successors. Marcellus was cremated, as was the Roman way, and his remains were the first to be placed in the newly constructed Mausoleum of Augustus. If Agrippa wasn't exactly family, that could be remedied easy enough. In 21 BC, Augustus arranged the marriage of Agrippa and his daughter Julia. Together they had five children. Either of the two older boys, Gaius and Lucius, would make a fine heir someday, but they would remain too young for many years. Agrippa remained the successor for now. Until he wasn't. In 13 BC, Agrippa had completed a campaign of conquest in Pannonia, the region north of Illyria and south of the Danube River, in what's now Hungary and Austria. He returned home in 12 BC and suddenly fell ill and died. With Gaius and Lucius still too young, Augustus had to turn elsewhere for the time. His next targets for succession were his two stepsons, Tiberius and Drusus, the children of his wife Livia. I know that these family ties are confusing, with a family tree looking more like a family web, so I encourage you to look up a family tree of the Julio-Claudian dynasty if you want to follow along. It will make things a little more clear. Anyway, both Tiberius and Drusus, born in 42 and 38 BC, respectively, had taken on increasing political and military duties in the prior few years. In 20 BC, Tiberius had been put in command of a Roman invasion of Armenia to secure the kingdom as a client state of Rome. He was successful in these actions and had played a key role in securing the legionary eagle standards that had been lost to Parthia several decades earlier. A couple years later, he and his brother Drusus successfully ended a revolt of some of the Raetian Alpine tribes. Drusus had been commended for his bravery. In 15 BC, Drusus was made governor of the three provinces of Gaul, administering from Lugdunum, modern Léon, France. He joined with his father-in-law, who was also in Gaul from 14 to 12 BC, constructing a series of bases along the Rhine River. Beginning in 12 BC, Drusus began a series of incursions across the Rhine into Germania, 
He found extraordinary success, and it was clear that Augustus favored Drusus over his older brother Tiberius. Drusus was a natural leader. When Augustus died, while his grandsons by Agrippa were still too young, Drusus would be his successor. Until he wasn't. In 9 BC, in a freak accident, Drusus fell from his horse on campaign and suffered internal injuries. Tiberius heard the news and raced to his brother's side. Thirty days after his fall, Drusus died. Augustus now rested his hopes on Tiberius for the moment. Tiberius didn't exactly enjoy admiration from Augustus or the armies he commanded, but he did earn their confidence and loyalty, and that was enough. Tiberius followed up on his brother's campaigns in Germania and became consul. In 6 BC, though, Tiberius suddenly slipped away to the island of Rhodes and appeared to retire from public life. He didn't leave a goodbye letter, so the reasons he left are open to speculation. The two most likely theories are, he either had enough of tolerating his wife Julia, the wife Augustus had forced upon him, who not so secretly engaged in numerous infidelities, or, as Augustus' grandsons Gaius and Lucius grew older, it became increasingly clear that Tiberius was merely a placeholder for them. Perhaps a combination of the two reasons. Either way, he quietly escaped to Rhodes and refused calls to return. Tiberius remained on the Greek island for eight years. In his absence, Augustus hurried along his grandsons. In 5 BC, he made Gaius a consul, and for the first time in decades, took the other consulship for himself to help train his grandson. In 2 BC, he did the same for Lucius. Both boys were given command of armies on the frontiers. But the frontiers are a dangerous place, especially for potential successors to Augustus. First, in 2 AD, on his way to Hispania, Lucius fell ill and died in Gaul. Tiberius finally returned to Rome soon after. In 4 BC, at the age of 23, Gaius was away in Armenia. While dealing with some rebels, he fell into a trap and was wounded. He was saved by his men, but the wound became infected, and he slowly but surely lost his strength and died. Augustus' grandsons had been the perfect heirs, until they weren't. Augustus adopted his stepson as his son and granted him tribunal powers. With all the other names crossed off the list, Tiberius was Augustus' last option. Augustus's emphasis on stability applied not only politically, but to the borders of the empire he was stewarding out of chaos. Rome had expanded in fits and bursts over the prior three centuries, without a grand plan overseeing its shape. There were plenty of places where the line between Rome and other wasn't clear, and that lack of clarity was an invitation for violence. Really, though, any border invites disruption. Best to have no border at all, or if that's not possible, have a desert or a mountain or a river be the border. So as princeps, Augustus cleaned up the Roman map. He directed a number of campaigns in Iberia that secured the remainder of the peninsula. In Anatolia, the central region of Galatia had been ignored by the Romans, becoming an enclave. Augustus filled in this gap in his map and absorbed the region. He expanded Roman control inland and north of Illyria into the region of Pannonia and pushed the borders to the Danube River, halting the incursion of a people called the Dacians from trickling into the area. And that finally takes us to the Rhine frontier, near the borders of modern France and Germany. Julius Caesar had conquered Gaul in the 50s BC. His conquest had been triggered by German tribes making incursions into Gaul and causing chaos among the Gallic tribes there. Caesar had used this chaos to his advantage, dividing and conquering the region. The precedent of German incursions throwing the now Roman province of Gaul into chaos was thus an early one, and surely for those Gauls or Romans living near the Rhine, the river itself seemed dangerously porous. The instability of the Rhine River as a frontier was further proven in the year 16 BC, when three Germanic tribes, the Sicambri, Tancteri, and Usipi, crossed the Rhine, raided into Gaul, pillaging and destroying. Before returning home across the river, they defeated a Roman army under the consul Lollius's control. This Claudius Lalliana, or the Lollian disaster, spurred Augustus to action. Gaul may have been ripening into a prosperous province, 
but it could only remain prosperous if it were secure from these attacks. Augustus had two options for securing Gaul, fortify the Rhine River, or push the frontier further, integrating the troublesome German tribes rather than defending against them. Augustus's first attempt was integration. Why not? No other region had successfully resisted the Romans once they had really set their mind to conquering and integrating. In 14 BC, he personally came to Gaul and oversaw the reorganization of the armies. He brought Drusus with him, and they built military bases and built up the legions along the Rhine. Before returning to Rome in 12 BC, he planned a series of campaigns for Drusus and made him the governor of Gaul. That same year, after securing an alliance with a German tribe in what's now the Netherlands, Drusus and his army launched an expedition out from the Rhine Delta into the dangerous North Sea and traveled up the coast to modern Lower Saxony and put the Chaucy tribe to battle until they surrendered and agreed to a treaty. On their return trip, they were attacked by another German tribe while at sea, but successfully repelled them. Drusus returned to Gaul, then went on to spend the winter in Rome. His successes won him universal praise. In 11 BC, Drusus crossed the Rhine River from a base in modern Xanten, Germany, about 40 miles west of Dortmund. His army marched for over 100 miles along the Lippo River before finally reaching the Weser River. They circled back and were headed home toward the Rhine when they were ambushed by the Cheruski. They were attacked while marching in their long column and had nearly been defeated, but they had managed to form up and repel the barbarians. Before reaching Gaul, Drusus established the first two Roman garrisons on that side of the river. Although weary from the campaign, his soldiers hailed him as Imperator, Conqueror. He went to Rome again, where he was honored and elected consul. He then returned to Gaul and crossed back into Germania with his army. Clearly the Romans were on a mission bigger than just intimidation. This time, they began farther south and fought their way through the Chatti and the Sugambri tribes. They crossed the Weser River and kept heading east. This was farther into Germania than any Roman army had traveled before. They now reached the Elba River, and Drusus was eager to cross it. But an apparition of a huge and pale German woman speaking perfect Latin appeared to him and told him, or ordered him, not to cross the river. He heeded the warning. They were now deep in the heart of Germania, closer to the modern border with Poland than to the Rhine. They turned and began the long march back. On the journey, Drusus fell from his horse and in a bizarre accident, injured his leg so bad that gangrene set in. He held on for 30 days, long enough for Tiberius to reach his side before he passed. A tower was built in modern Mainz, Germany, honoring Drusus, and it still stands there today. The campaigns of Drusus had begun the process of securing imperial control of Germania. He had built alliances with many of the locals, and while there was still a fair share of resistance, the new garrisons ensured that soldiers could be sent out to pacify rebellions. Tiberius was now put in charge of the campaigns in Germania. For the next two years, 8 and 7 BC, Tiberius destroyed the rebellious Sicambri tribe and transported the survivors over to Gaul, where they could be watched more closely. According to Roman historians, Germania had been pacified and was well on its way to becoming a true Roman province. As we mentioned earlier, family or succession drama spurred Tiberius to go into exile in 6 BC. In his place, a general named Ahenobarbus was put in command of action in Germania. He followed up on the work of Tiberius and began engineering projects, creating new garrisons and building causeways across the many wetlands. In imitation of Tiberius, he tried to pacify or destroy another tribe, the Cheruski, just as Tiberius had done to the Sicambri. But Ahenobarbus performed poorly, whether due to his deficiencies or the Cheruski's strengths. He was recalled to Rome in 2 BC and was replaced with Marcus Vincius. This new general led the five legions in Germania and at first had a lot of success. But in an event we know very little about, the Roman historian Paterculus states that a large number of tribes rebelled in a vast war. We only know that Vincius performed admirably because he was awarded a triumph. By this point, Augustus' grandsons were gone, and Tiberius had returned to public life. In 4 AD, Tiberius took back up command in Germania, and was again successful, 
he subdued several troublesome tribes, including the Cheruski, who Tiberius considered so pacified that they were now friends of the Roman people. He felt Roman armies could now move anywhere between the Rhine and the Elbe River with impunity. By all accounts, the region of Germania had been conquered. In 6 AD, Augustus made plans for a new task for his adopted son. In what's now Bohemia, a German king named Maro Budus, king of the Marcomanni, had established a powerful confederation of tribes under his command. Augustus considered him a threat, and plans were begun to deal with him. Tiberius gathered 11 legions, pulling 8 of the legions then stationed in Germania away from the area. Just 3 legions remained there. Just as Tiberius began his campaign, though, he was rudely interrupted by a massive revolt in the provinces of Illyria. The revolt began among non-Roman auxiliary soldiers, led by Beto the Dicidiate in modern Bosnia, but soon spread to other tribes in the province and in neighboring Pannonia. The revolt quickly became a serious threat to Roman control of the area. The invasion against Marobodus in Bohemia had to be abandoned. The Romans avoided a disaster that could have faced them with a war against the Marcomanni on top of the revolt, but they were fortunate. Marobodus agreed to an honorable peace. Tiberius brought the army that had been assembling to march to Bohemia east and south and entered Illyria. The rebels engaged in effective guerrilla warfare, but Tiberius ruthlessly and systematically eliminated the threat by destroying the crops that fed the rebels and by staying in the province for three consecutive springs, he prevented new crops from being planted. His own troops were well fed. Despite the criticism he faced back in Rome, Tiberius stuck with his plan, and by 9 AD, the starving rebels began to disband. Just as the last resistance was surrendering, as Tiberius celebrated a triumph in Rome, word arrived from Germania of a disaster. Following the departure of Tiberius, Augustus appointed Publius Quintilius Varus as the first governor of Germany. Varus was high up in the imperial inner circle. He had married the daughter of Agrippa, Vipsania, and he had served with Tiberius as consul in 13 BC. Varus was an experienced governor, having served in Africa and in Syria. He had a reputation for harsh rule and high taxes. Not fun for the populace, but great for the imperial officials. The historian Patriculus says of Varus, He was a man of mild character and of quiet disposition, somewhat slow in mind as he was in body, and more accustomed to the leisure of the camp than to actual service in war. That he was no despiser of money is demonstrated by his governorship of Syria. He entered this rich province a poor man and left this poor province a rich man. This seems harsh. The fleecing of the provinces was by now a favorite Roman pastime. And if he was of mild character, he was no pushover. Varus had successfully put down a Masonic revolt in Judea in 4 BC that had risked spilling over into a larger rebellion. With Germania conquered, Varus seemed like a fine choice to begin administering the province. And that's just what Varus did. He began to treat Germania as any other province of the empire. He began appointing magistrates to govern, began hearing cases and acting as a judge for disputes among the locals, and he began to collect taxes. After 25 years of Roman presence in the area, many of the elite among the local tribes had aligned themselves with their new overlords. Others were less satisfied with the occupation, and often, these divisions ran straight through tribes. One such tribe was the Cheruski, although the Romans wouldn't have noticed the divisions. The Cheruski were on friendly terms with the Romans, and Varus in particular. A man named Arminius, who came from a noble family of the Cheruski, had served in Roman armies between 1 and 6 AD. He had been granted Roman citizenship and achieved the rank of an equestrian. His experience and background gave him both knowledge of Roman tactics and the opportunity to gain the trust of Varus. In secret, though, Arminius had other plans. Perhaps Arminius had always secretly harbored anger or hatred of the Roman occupation, or perhaps the weight of governance that Varus implemented turned Arminius against his former friends. Arminius began a plot to free his country from Roman rule, and he quietly began to recruit co-conspirators from among his own tribe and other tribes. In 9 AD, Arminius knew the time was ripe to act. 
Remember, Tiberius had just taken 8 of the 11 legions away from the area in 6 AD to deal with the Illyrian revolts. With just 3 legions nearby, now is the chance. So that's the context in which our fictional character Fabius found himself marching through the north of Germania under the command of Varus. Varus and his three legions, the 17th, 18th, and 19th, had spent the summer near the Weser River, about halfway between the Rhine frontier and the Elbe, near the territory of the Cheruski. Arminius was with the army, helping them on their expeditions. When September arrived, Varus gathered his armies and began marching them back toward their bases across the Rhine. This was when Arminius began his deceit. He came to Varus and explained that he had heard reports of rebellious tribes to their northwest. Varus considered the idea. It was only a two-day detour off the main road west. Better to put the revolt down now instead of letting it grow and spread while the soldiers were away for the winter. Varus liked the idea. As they approached the detour, another of the nobles of the Cheruski came to Varus with a warning. This man's name was Segestes, and he was the begrudging father-in-law of Arminius. He had caught wind of the plot his son-in-law was preparing, and he went to Varus and told him not to trust Arminius. Varus waved off the warning. He trusted Arminius, and probably thought Segestes was trying to draw him into a feud between the two. As the three legions, along with cohorts of auxiliary soldiers and cavalry units, marched in their long column, they would have stretched out for over a mile and a half along the road. When they turned off the main road onto the detour, they had to stretch out even farther. The trail they followed now was narrow and less well-maintained. Down trees and washed-out sections of the trail slowed their progress. The supply wagons that traveled with them would have had difficulties with the mud. They were a ways north of the normal campaign routes of the Romans, in uncharted territory, so Arminius, with his cohort, led the army. At some point, Arminius got the okay from Varus, who marched in the center of the column, to go ahead of the legions, probably to scout. Arminius and his cohort went ahead of the column and disappeared. The woods to the left of the legions rose up into a large hill, and on their right was a wide swamp. The trail curved to get past the hill without going through the marshes. Here was the choke point. Hidden up on the hillside, Arminius had stationed soldiers from five Germanic tribes. An earthen wall had been constructed and camouflaged for the Germans to hide behind. The sources differ on the exact details of the battle. The oldest sources suggest everything happened all at once, while later sources claim the Romans were ambushed initially but then escaped and regrouped only to be ambushed again. My fictional version at the beginning of the episode most closely follows the older versions. As the strung out column arrived, suddenly Arminius' army threw a barrage of spears down on the Romans, the projectiles gaining momentum as they fell down. This initial barrage was devastating, but could easily have been followed up with subsequent volleys. The legions would have had no warning, and many would have died or been mortally wounded immediately. The column descended into chaos in seconds. Some appear to have tried to form up, or tried to scale the wall, to take the fight to the Germans. We know this because at the archaeological site, at the base of Calcariese Hill, Arminius' wall has been found, and at its base are numerous Roman weapons and pieces of armor. As the terrible sounds of fighting drifted down the line, the legions farther back began to push forward to get to the fighting to help their comrades. But this push only shoved more soldiers into the chaotic trap. Soldiers who were not smashed together on the narrow trail began to flee. Some would have tried to turn and run back the way they came, further clogging up the path. Others tried their luck in the marsh. One of two fates awaited them there, drowning in the marsh, being pulled down into the mire by their heavy armor, or a faster death from the companies of Germans hiding in wait on patches of dry ground. At some point, back on the trail, the Germans leapt from behind their wall and engaged the legions face to face. They would have known the dangers of facing the legions directly, but in this cramped chaos, they had all the advantage. Farther back in the line, more Germans who had been in hiding now leapt out of the woods and came down upon the Romans. Varus and his bodyguard had nowhere to go. Some sources say that Varus and his companions escaped on horseback, but were chased down and surrounded. Whether it was after fleeing or right there next to his legions, all agree that when he saw escape was hopeless, Instead of facing capture and slow torture, Varus fell on his sword 
killing himself. Some soldiers did manage to escape from the slaughter. Most were chased down and killed, but a few survived, snuck through the woods for days, and finally made it back across the Rhine, bringing news to the rest of the Roman world. In what has come to be called the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, the two sides had nearly even numbers. We have a better idea of the Roman side. Each of the three legions would have had around 5,000 men. Add to that the auxiliary troops and cavalry units, and it's likely over 20,000 soldiers had been on the march. The vast majority never left the woods. The size of the army that Arminius had put together is hard to estimate, but conservative guesses are over 18,000. Their losses were much smaller. The pacified province of Germania turned out not to be so peaceful after all. In an instant, three legions had been destroyed, more than 10% of the empire's 28 legions. The news reached Rome soon after Tiberius had returned from putting down the revolt in Illyria, as celebrations of his victory were taking place. Augustus received the news with total shock. The news caused his emotions to break out of his usually stoic disposition. For months afterward, he refused to cut his hair or his beard, and he was seen several times with his head against a wall saying, Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions. Tacitus says that for the remaining years of his life, he observed the anniversary of the disaster with sorrow and mourning. As Augustus mourned the loss of his legions, Arminius and the coalition he had put together took advantage of their victory. Once they had exterminated the wounded from the battlefield, taken their captives, making some slaves, and sacrificing others to their gods, they got to work removing the Roman presence from their country. The Romans had several permanent settlements on the east side of the Rhine. Some were only small garrisons, but others, including Haltern, the base on the Vesa River where Varus had been stationed with his legions, Oberaden, a large fortress that Drusus had built along the Lippa River, 60 miles from the Rhine, and a new Roman town at Waldgirmis, 30 miles north of modern Frankfurt, which was only discovered in the 1990s and included a forum and a marketplace. There were likely many Romans living in these places, and many more Romanized natives. The archaeological evidence does seem to point to many areas of Germania, between the Rhine and the Elbe becoming a fairly Roman place. But the victory of Arminius put an end to all of that. He and his coalition went from settlement to fortress to town, ransacking and destroying them all. With the legions destroyed, there was no one to stop them. At all of the Roman archaeological sites, the Roman coins cannot be dated to any time after 9 AD. Every trace of the invaders was removed. Arminius and his coalition had freed Germania from Roman conquest. Or so the story goes. I tend to be skeptical of claims that such and such an event had world-altering impacts. When I first started researching the disaster of the Teutoburg Forest and the claim that this battle decisively shut the door to Roman expansion into Germania, the claim seemed overblown. This certainly wouldn't be the last time the Romans campaigned across the Rhine. When Augustus had recovered from the news, Tiberius was sent to the Rhine that same year. In 10 AD, he went on small, punitive expeditions across the Rhine. In the next decade, we will see Germanicus, the son of Drusus, take the fight back to the German alliance established by Arminius. So clearly, the Romans could still campaign in Germania if they chose to. As for the loss of three legions, it was certainly not a small loss, but Rome had suffered far worse in its wars against Hannibal and still managed to continue the fight. So why should this specific defeat be the end of expansion in Germany? A few reasons. The first is psychological. The defeat by Arminius of the Cherusci and his coalition of Germans played right into a specter haunting the Roman mind. The cultural memory was one of barbarian tribes invading Italy and sacking Rome itself. This phobia had begun with the Gallic sack of Rome almost 400 years before, when a tribe of Gauls had marched down and destroyed Rome, almost ending the Roman story right then. And now, barbarians far to the north and their strange and misty land had destroyed a tenth of the Roman armies in just an instant. No, better to leave the Germans alone. Second, the Romans had to consider if conquering Germania was really worth the cost and effort. It seems that Augustus had initially planned to set the Elba River as the border of the empire. But why the Elba and not the Rhine? What did Rome gain from controlling this uncivilized, distant region? Originally, the goal had been to keep the German tribes from invading Gaul by conquering them, 
That was one way to do things, but better defenses at the Rhine could achieve the same goal. On an economic level, it just wasn't worth the effort to govern the province. Germania was a very different place from others Rome had conquered. Syria had its trade networks, rich cities, and access by sea. Hispania had its natural resources, especially its mines. But what about Gaul or Britain, which would be conquered just a few decades later? As for Britain, well, we will have to see in a few decades why the Romans took an interest in conquering there. The answer regarding Gaul is simpler. Gaul had rich farmlands, navigable rivers, large cities, and no clear border between the Mediterranean area, which Rome already controlled for centuries, and the rest of the country that Caesar had conquered. There's an argument to be made that it was the culture of the Germans in the area that made it too difficult to conquer. The lack of cities or large towns in the area meant there was nowhere concrete that the Romans could conquer and hold. Ties in the region were very local and decentralized. In a region like Syria, the Romans could come in and capture Antioch or Damascus and essentially control the whole province. The local people there were already used to looking to those cities for their leadership. Now, there was just a new administration in charge. They still paid their taxes, just to new tax collectors, and they still went to these same cities when they needed to settle a dispute. But when it came to Germania, that wasn't the case. Instead of two large centers, there were dozens of small towns or villages, and the region was split between competing and cooperating networks of tribes, with loose boundaries between them. The people were probably not used to paying a tax in the manner the Romans expected, and when it came to justice, their chieftains were the authorities. Gaul would have had some of these characteristics, especially as you got farther from the Mediterranean, but Germania was far on the other side of the centralization spectrum from Syria. That didn't mean conquest would have been impossible. As we've seen, the Romans had done a nice job of it. It just required more effort for less reward. Each tribe the Romans encountered would have to be subdued and integrated one by one. But it seems the Romans under Drusus, Tiberius, and Ahenobarbus had done that. Many of the tribes between the Rhine and the Elba were friendly with Rome, and even among the Trusci, there was a strong faction in favor of an alliance. With Arminius' rebellion and his formation of a confederation of tribes allied against Rome, the slow and difficult work of integrating each tribe was suddenly turned back. With their loss, the Romans had lost 25 years of progress. So again, when the decision between reconquering the area or abandoning it had to be made, they had to ask if it was worth it. And it seems their answer was no. It's not that it wouldn't have been possible for the Romans to buckle down and slowly recapture the lost territory across the Rhine, but it just wasn't worth it for them. Let's talk about the wider impact of this loss of Germania and get into some counterfactuals, or what-ifs. So, what if Varus had taken seriously the warning of Segestes and killed Arminius for his betrayal before the ambush? Or Tiberius had decided that the reconquest of Germania was essential and had recaptured the lost province? With the Roman Empire extending to the Elba River, I think we are looking at a very different world, and I don't think it would necessarily have been a good one for the Romans. Let's say they conquered to the Elba and stopped there. I think many of the problems faced by the later empire would have been faced at an earlier date, and I think the fall of the Roman Empire, the West at least, would have come sooner than it actually did, in the 47th decade of our era. In this alternate timeline, there would still have been a need for a large buildup of fortifications and soldiers along the border, at the Elba instead of the Rhine, because the tribes to the east of the Elba would have been just as dangerous as the tribes on the far side of the Rhine were. I think the incorporation of Germania into the empire would have sped up the Germanization of the army that the late empire experienced, and it would have faced all the problems that went along with the process at an earlier date. When the Germanic migrations really got going in the 300s, if the border was at the Elba, Rome would have experienced those migrations sooner and without the hundreds of miles of buffer that the region of Germania provided. And when the Huns arrived in the 400s, the empire was already devastated by their attacks on Gaul. Imagine if the empire had defended or had to endure the destruction of Germania as well. I know that's not a lot of detail, but we'll get into these events before long. Second, as a frontier, I don't think the Elba is any better than the Rhine, and it's probably a worse border. The gap between the Rhine and the Danube River, which formed the northeastern border of the empire, is very small, and today they're even connected by a canal. The gap between the Elba and the Danube is much larger. The Rhine is a slightly larger river as well, 
So why choose the smaller of the two? The real issue is, if the border is pushed out to the Elba River, why not farther? If the Rhine isn't a suitable border, the Elba wouldn't be any better. And if the Elba isn't good enough, and you keep going east, the Dnieper or the Volga rivers are no better. You have to expand the border hundreds of miles out into the Eurasian steppe of Ukraine and western Russia, all the way to the Ural Mountains before you reach another border that is better than the Elba or the Rhine. Now, if you're optimistic on the Romans, maybe you can imagine a future for them in which they do just that, in which they conquer all of Central Europe and just keep expanding east, all the way to the Urals. This empire would be a far different place than the one we find in our reality. It wouldn't be a Mediterranean empire any longer. The idea stretches into pure imagination. In 9 AD, the Romans were ambushed and lost 25 years of progress in conquering Germania. To reconquer the territory, they would be starting back at square one, and it just wasn't worth the effort. Had they conquered it, the Germans would have slowly become assimilated. Small towns would have grown into regional trade-in centers and then cities. The elites would have sent their sons to Greece or Italy to learn philosophy, grammar, and rhetoric. Slowly, they would have abandoned their Germanic language and adopted the Latin of their conquerors. Instead, Arminius's victory ensured that the people on the far side of the Rhine would keep their separate language, culture, and governance for centuries. On the opposite side of the Roman Empire, in this decade, or likely a couple years before it began actually, a boy named Yeshua was born in Judea. His humble birth went unnoticed by the powers in Rome. Within a few short decades though, he had gathered a loyal following that claimed that his birth had been the birth of a god. Next time, we cover 10 to 19 AD, and we will see the death of a god, as old Augustus finally breathes his last. If you've enjoyed this show, please leave a rating or a review. You can follow this show on Twitter at 202Decades. I'll see you next time.